If you ask me who my God is, on whose name I call, if you ask me who my God is, He's the God of us all, Allah the Merciful. If you ask me what my book is that I hold in my hand, if you ask me what my book is, it's the Holy Quran, the Holy Quran. Mm. Assalamu alaikum and peace, and welcome to this episode of Misconceptions. My name is Muhammad Hashim, and with us in the studio today we have Yusuf Estes. Assalamu alaikum. Wa alaikum salam, rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. We also have in the audience our studio audience. Assalamu alaikum. Wa alaikum salam, rahmatullahi In this episode of Misconceptions, we are talking about scholars, ulama, and the many misconceptions surrounding scholars and who they are and what they do. So, where can we begin our conversation, actually? First of all, let's take the word itself. Scholars is an English word related to the word school scholarly, but uh, that's about it. Let's move now to the Arabic word that we're talking about. The word we're talking about in Arabic is alim. The plural is ulama. ulama. And alim is coming from the word ilm, and it means to know. These are the people who have knowledge. Knowledge based on Islam. That's the kind of scholar we're talking about. Not just the scientists in general, but the scholars of Islam and what it contains. And with that, I think we should immediately go to our audience and see what kind of misconceptions have you encountered. People ask you questions like what, for instance? Yes, I have a question. Um, what is a scholar? A short question. Okay. It's a simple question, but it's, a, it's an important one because what is a scholar? What are the credentials? Or what okay, it, what first let me tell you what a scholar is not. Okay. Me. I am not a scholar. I have never said I'm a scholar. If anybody said that, shame on them. I didn't say that. What, what I do personally is call scholars, talk to scholars, go to their places, sit with them, read the books with them, and make sure that I understand from somebody who's in authority to pass knowledge, just like you would with a professor, any teacher, somebody who has knowledge. And this is very, very important. If you rely on dreams, impressions, and visions, it may or may not be correct. But at least when I go and talk to these people, I can get a much better perspective on what's happening. And that's all I do. I try to put it in simple English. Now let us come to what is a scholar. First of all, a scholar of Islam must know the classical Arabic language. It's called Fusha. This is the language of the Quran. It was the language of Muhammad, peace be upon him. And it is a language still alive today although most Arab countries have a form of it, of their own dialect that they use. But all Arabs recognize the Quran and its authenticity in the classical Arabic language. So the next thing is to memorize the Quran. A scholar memorizes the entire Quran, or at least most of it, and knows about it, how it came, and what was meant by what is said. They also have studied the life of the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, based on historians, hadith, which we've talked about in another program, the stories about the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him. And these eyewitness reports and stories explain to us what the Quran is. These scholars have a full comprehensive knowledge of the overall of Islam. Then on top of that, they will have a specific part of Islam that they will deal with. Very similar to what we have in our doctors today where you might find somebody says, I'm a medical doctor. Mm -hmm. Okay, he's a doctor of medicine. But within that, what is your specialty? I'm a surgeon. A surgeon of what? He is an orthopedic surgeon. This means he deals mostly with the feet. It doesn't mean he doesn't know anything about your nose or your ears or eyes. It doesn't mean he doesn't know about your chest. But his specialty is operating on the feet. Now, you could carry it to other areas, the brain, the heart, and so on, but you get the concept. The same is true in Islam. Someone may be a scholar, and in particular of hadith, we'd call him muhaddith, and he is in that science. Somebody could memorize the Quran, he's a hafiz of the Quran, but that doesn't make him a scholar of the Quran. Mm. 
He just memorized it. We want to know what does he know about the Quran to go with it. Is he familiar with Usul al-Quran? Is he familiar with Usul al-Hadith? Or Sharia? Or Fiqh? And there are many issues, even in the Sirah or the biography of the Prophet. All of these things comprise what a scholar is and a level of a scholar and how much he studied, from who he studied, what books he's read, what he's memorized, and then his application, how he has applied what he knows and put it into a, a way that we can understand it. Books that he wrote, speeches and lectures that he's given, the way he answers questions, all of this is relative to being a true scholar of Islam, and very few people on earth can qualify as a true scholar of Islam. So it's a real privilege, and I guess you've got to be really specific in... Oh, it's you know, an amazing it's thing from Almighty God. This is, this is not something small. This is a true gift from Almighty God. Okay. There's no knowledge, by the way, except Allah has to give it to the person. And with that, I'd like to turn to the audience and ask for another question, please. Yes, I have a question. Are scholars higher than the prophets? Oh, that's a, that's a nice Whoa. question. Higher than the prophets, I guess. Okay, I did not mean to give that impression. By what I was saying, yes, I'm saying that these are, are people who are favored by Allah, these are people blessed by Allah, but at the same time, I have to tell you, they are not prophets, they're not the same as prophets, they carry the message of prophets, but scholars could also be evil, okay, just because they know doesn't mean that they're sharing properly or that they're doing it for the right reason. Not necessarily a sin sincerity. Yeah, but I don't mean to imply that in the wrong way, but just to say that they're human beings. They could be doing it on purpose wrong. They could make a mistake. Uh, none of the prophets made any mistakes in how they delivered the message. But for sure, we as human beings can. Even scholars can make mistakes. The majority of the scholars, even living today, are doing an excellent job with few, if any, mistakes in, in the majority of the areas. However, there are those who make mistakes, but we don't say that a scholar making mistakes is the same as somebody that's out here, uh, an ignorant person doing it. Because the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, mm -hmm. told us that scholars, when they strive and struggle to come to a conclusion, if they're right, Allah gives them a double reward. But if they're wrong, they still get a full reward. And you say, wait a minute, if he's wrong, why would he get a reward? Well, he got rewarded for his intention, didn't he? He got rewarded for what he's trying to do. But the fact that he was wrong means that all he, he got a reward. You still can't follow him on that. If you know he made a mistake, then you're not allowed to follow him. Just because the Prophet Sallallahu said he got a reward, it means he got reward for what he did, but you still have to follow the one who got the double reward that was right in the answer. The right thing, Does that make yeah. sense? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Makes a lot of sense. So they're not prophets. They're not like prophets. They don't come with miracles or anything like that. They're scholars. We give them honor, which we should, respect, which we should. But if they make mistakes, you're free to say, Sir, I'm wondering if you made a mistake. Uh, where can we get the evidence for this? Now, all scholars expect that you will ask them where the proof is. Anybody who says something about Islam and can't prove where it is, First of all, he's not a scholar. Okay. Second of all, he shouldn't take a, any kind of offense at that because this is what we're taught to ask. Ana Dalil, where is your proof? Make sense? Let's take another question. Yes, yeah, sir. Uh, I have a question. Why are scholars important in Islam? That's a very important question. Why are they important in Islam? What would we do without them? <laughs> well, if we don't have scholars, then all of us would be out here trying to make up our own way. We have a billion and a half, one and a half billion Muslims walking around on the planet today of all different levels of understanding of Islam. If each of them was left to his own understanding, we would actually have one and a half billion brand new religions, just like that. So what we want to say is that scholars are exactly what preserve the true religion of Muhammad, peace be upon him. Without our scholars, we would not be able to really understand the Quran and the teachings of Muhammad. We couldn't. And along with that, I should also mention that there have been periods of time in history when the enemies to Islam tried to eliminate Islam by eliminating scholars, okay. not the least of which happened about uh, 90 years ago. And that was at the time of Kemal Ataturk in Turkey and what happened there. And he actually hung all of the scholars, even the ones that had taught him. 
So, but it didn't work because, again, there were a lot of people who would go to scholars in other areas and still learn Islam and try to preserve it. Turkey today, by the way, is a good place to get knowledge. I've been there and taken knowledge from their scholars. So scholars are scholars wherever they are on the earth. As long as they rely on the Quran and the Sunnah, which is the Hadith, you know, we talked about, as long as they were relying on that in the Arabic language with the understanding, I'm seeing no problem in listening to what they have to say. What about if the scholars aren't keeping up with what's happening in today's society and if there are different opinions between the scholars? What happens then? Huh, that's a very important question. What I have seen happen that caused some serious problems is when we, the ignorant people, go to the scholars, take what they say, take it out of context, or take it to another place. One of the things scholars do is base their decisions and understandings for today's world based on the condition of the people. Now, if some scholar who is in one nation or country is giving a ruling there, and his ruling, based on what he knows, all of a sudden doesn't work in another country. Mm -hmm. You see what's going to happen? Now they're going to say, well, Islam has got a problem here. Well, that scholar is for this country in this area, never traveled to any other country, doesn't know it. This is what he knows, and he's telling you correctly for what he knows where he is and what he grew up with. But the Quran and the Hadith are not the problem. It's how he understands the situation of the people. So this is one problem. Another problem comes when an ignorant person like us goes to the scholar and we hear something and then we say, well, I don't know, let me go ask somebody else. And then he gives us a little bit different answer. Or we go to another part of the world and we get a different answer. And so then we start saying, oh, well, this scholar versus that scholar, his different opinions. They put it on the Internet. They, they take things out of context, especially when they retranslate what they say. All of this adds up to problems in the rulings of the scholars. But it doesn't change what Islam is really saying. But it's talking about what these rulings or what um, they call fatawa. Fatawa. Yeah, fatawa, what their fatawa is or fatwas, and it gives people a really strange impression and confuses even the Muslims because of that. Okay, well on that note, we're going to go for a quick break. You're here watching Misconceptions with me, Muhammad Hashim. Assalamu alaikum. <laughs> Hopefully we'll discuss some, some tips on, on how to increase the, the ability of getting the du'a or the supplication answered. Allah delays giving you what you want and gives you a reward that is equal to that or better in this life or in the world to come uh, for giving you your sins and giving you good deeds. I'm going to look at some questions that we've asked some of our brothers on the street. Uh, we asked them, should Muslims have a dialogue with other religions? We're going to need some stability. So. We, uh, it doesn't matter where we live, we need to care for those ones to give them the rights that Allah gives. This life is not the eternal life, it is a test. Particularly for the youth of today. So if there are any parents or uncles or whoever is watching, if you have 16, 17, 18, 20 year olds with you, make sure they stop doing whatever they're doing and come in and watch this show, inshallah. <laughs> and welcome back to Misconceptions. Our misconception for today, uh, all the misconceptions about the scholars. So where can we continue our conversation about who the scholars are and what people perceive them to be? I think we should start with another question. Let's go to the audience and find what other misconceptions have we about uh, our scholars. Yes, I have a question. You mentioned fatwa. What is a fatwa? You did fatwa. mention fatwa a couple of well, times, I did, didn't, didn't I? <laughs> what is a fatwa, Sheikh? How can we best explain that word in English? Uh, a ruling, a decision based on the information that the scholar has and then he derives out of that ruling. For instance, uh, I hope this is a good example, if somebody came to a scholar and said, in Islam can I do this or can I do that? And then he says, 
well, if you do this or that, then so and so and such. So he's giving a ruling based on what he knows and what he's understanding from you, how to apply something. For instance, microwave oven. Somebody comes and says to the chef, can I cook my food using microwave? Because at the time of Muhammad, peace be upon him, there was no such thing as electricity and nuclear energy and uh, all the rest of the things that we see today. Is, is this something haram? Am I doing something wrong to my food? Forbidden, you know, in Islam. And the scholar said, well, tell me more about microwave. What does it do? Is it nuclear energy? No, no. It's just changing the way that molecules move inside the food, heats it up, and blah, blah, blah. And he said, I don't see any problem with it. Okay. Then that's his ruling. No problem, go ahead. Simple as that. That's his ruling. And if he goes to another, say, scholar, and it's completely different, that's where, I guess that's where the arguments begin. And yeah, because confusion. maybe a scholar, another scholar said, oh, uh, he thought maybe they're using something in there that is a forbidden process, or he thought maybe that there was something in there contaminating the food, then he might rule the other way. So it needs to be that he has a clear understanding of the ahwal or condition. Because if he's a scholar of Islam, he knows the Quran, he knows the Sunnah, he understands that. But these other things he may not understand very well. So he needs uh, initial clarification from the person and then he can work on it from there. I think we should also <laughs> realize that there are people out there who are giving the scholar status to people who are not scholars. Very often I hear people come to me and consider me as a scholar in that area, and I'm not. I never said I was. And they'll ask me, what about this, what about that? Then they're disappointed when I say, I can't answer your question. They say, well, I, I thought you know this and you know that. I say, for me, I do know some things, but I'm not going to give it to you. I'm going to tell you to go to the place I got it from. And that, that's only fair. Because unless I could confidently say, yeah, I'm a scholar of Islam to myself, and I know where the sources are, then what am I doing? You know, I'm going to just stick my neck out for what? I don't need to go to hell <laughs> over something like that's that. That's a big responsibility, isn't it? Right, You've yeah. said it, and that's it. Look, look what Islam is teaching about scholars. The first people to be thrown in the hellfire of all the people on the earth, the ones that will be used to start the fire of hell, will be the scholars of Islam who preached it but didn't practice it. That's scary. That's very scary. Very scary. There's other hadith along the same line, but suffice to say it is too frightening for me to even open my mouth. I say, I don't know, and here's who you can ask. I don't know, but go to this website or read this book or that book. And when they're done, they might come back and say, well, you knew all along. I say, well, for me, I know, but not for you. Yeah. You need to know. So that's what I recommend. I always recommend learn Arabic language, study Quran in Arabic, study Hadith in Arabic, sit with scholars. You've heard me say it on every program practically. Go to the sources, go to the sources, go to the sources. That's the only way to do it. Let's take another question from the audience. Yes, yes. brother. Go ahead. Uh, who, give, who give the fatwa? Who? I guess who gives the fatwa? So who's, who's in charge of giving a fatwa? Who's qualified? Who's qualified? That's the word, yeah. Qualifications for a fatwa it will depend on the nature of the fatwa. I can give a fatwa, even though I'm not a scholar. If the fatwa is very simple, for instance, somebody said, this person would like to be a Muslim, okay? Can he be a Muslim? I say, okay, tell me something about him. Well, he believes in Allah, he believes in the messenger. I say, does he have any other religious ideas outside of Islam? Nope. Totally in the line of Islam. Does he want to be a Muslim? Yeah. Then, yes, he can be. There. There's a fatwa. That's a fatwa? Yeah. Okay. But it's not much of one, is it? <laughs> it's pretty obvious. You give me all that stuff and, and any, anybody could see that the, what the answer would be. Yeah. But as far as a real serious fatwa, dealing with subjects such as types of vocations people could pursue, careers, education, things like that, I prefer to have somebody come in and let's look and examine. When you start talking about the things you can ingest, whether through breathing or consuming food, and uh, what's halal and haram or the forbidden and the permissible, I like to go to the scholars, even if I know, just so I can verify and ask, where is this hadith, where is that ayah? Then when I see it clear, clear, then I can go, all right, he said it. Okay. And he based it on this. I'm actually just passing it, the fatwa. I'm still not really giving one. Mm. 
So what process is it to, to put a fatwa together? Like, who do the scholars have to speak to or console before they... It's a combination of a lot of information gathered over a number of years. It's not something that somebody's really born with. It's not a magic thing. I saw something on the internet one time. They said a seven-year-old boy is a big scholar of Islam that he wakes up in the morning and he can give fatwas and everything like that. That's nonsense. I don't care what he says. I don't care how he does it. This is something peculiar. This is something weird. It's not the way of Islam for the last 1,400 years. It's not something I'm ready to accept. I wouldn't care if he told me it was daylight and I could see the sun. I still wouldn't believe him simply because there's too many weird things about the way this seven-year-old boy is bringing all this information. Mm -hmm. uh, I, and I did see some stuff on the on the internet about it, but then the clarification came that it was a setup, that they had this boy staging this and things like that. So mm. uh, there are criterion for scholars, and it does take time, and it is something that they collaborate with each other. There's two basic rules you must realize about Islam, that Islam is insisting on the Muslims being together as what's called the jama'ah, together as a congregation. Number two, and this is also very, very important, that they take... Uh, opinion amongst themselves from this jama'ah and listen to the sources, Quran and Sunnah and understand it and then number three that they have an emir that they follow and when he makes a decision that's it. So taking opinion from real qualified scholars is always good and they do it collectively. Th these are just some of the basic principles and teachings. Okay. Have we any other questions today? Yes. What are the limits of fatwa? What are the limits okay, of fatwa? The limits of fatwa. So. Okay, there's a good one. <laughs> Immediately what comes in my mind about the limits of fatwa is that we have to remember that a scholar is not a prophet, something we heard earlier in the program. Number two, that he is basing what he says, his ruling is based on how he understands the Quran and the Sunnah. So if what he's saying does not comply with the overall understanding of Quran and the Sunnah or the Hadith of the Prophet, peace be upon him, be upon then what we would have to say is that we need to go to another scholar and ask for better for clarification. Or you could go back to him and just ask him for clarification. I think I'd start there and go back and say, hold on, before I accept this, it's that I'm confused because you said this, but it looks like the Quran said this, help me to understand. And if he says no, because this is the word in Arabic, not this word. You're using a translation. <gasps> oh, all right. Or if he said, look, the Hadith is very clear. In this case, it doesn't mean that. Let's take an example so we can see it. Uh, there's a verse in the Quran in chapter 2, Surah Baqarah, ayah number 185. Five, I think it's right in that area. It's talking about fasting. You, you fast in the month of Ramadan. But then when the sun goes down, you can start eating and drinking and enjoying the intimacy of your wife and a spouse and so on. Now, it tells us to continue enjoying until there, you're able to distinguish the white thread against the black thread. A companion of the Prophet Muhammad, peace, peace be upon, upon him, actually took a white thread and a black thread, laid them out there, and then when he got, was watching in the morning for the sun to start to come up. And the sun was actually up. He could see, oh my God, look, the sun's up, and I still can't quite see uh, these, either one of these threads. So he went back to the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, and asked for clarification. And the Prophet, peace be upon him, told him, look, this is not talking about thread. It's an expression. It means to be able to tell the white thread of morning against the black thread of the night. Of the, night mm. the first moment of dawn. That's what it was talking about. That's why we know we need to have hadith, because otherwise you wouldn't have understood the Quran. It's why we need to have scholars, otherwise we wouldn't understand hadith. We have to have people of knowledge to be able to break it down and bring it to us. Now, what is the role of somebody like me, not scholar, and you, not scholar, but yet we're talking about Islam, we're presenting Islam. We're called presenters. We're called, actually, callers. Da'i, du'at. Well, that's what we do. We're just calling people to go to the source, to go to the scholars, to learn from them. And we only know specific things, not everything. We can't say, no one knows everything. 
Nobody knows everything. Mm -hmm. that only Allah, even Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, didn't know everything. Even Jesus Christ, peace be upon him, didn't know everything. Only Allah is the Alim. Allah is Al Alim. He is the knowledge. Knowledge comes from him, emanates from him, and we don't have any knowledge except what he gives us. Look what he said in the Quran in chapter 2, verse 255. Yalamu ma bayna aidihim wa ma khawfahum. Wa la yuhi tunabi shayim min ilmihi illa bimisha. So here in this ayat of Kursi, is a famous verse of the Quran, Allah is saying that he has all knowledge of everything. Front, back, up, down, all around. Allah knows everything. And you don't have any knowledge. Illa, except what he wills for you to have. And that's where knowledge is coming from. As we mentioned earlier, the knowledge is only coming from Allah. And he gives it to whomever he wills. The best way to get the knowledge is in the Quran as well. It tells us how to ask for knowledge. Rabbi, my Lord, zidni, increase me, ilma, in knowledge. Rabbi, zidni, ilma. Allah, my Lord, increase me in knowledge. Well, that comes to the end of our show. You've been watching Misconceptions with me, Muhammad Hashim, and Sheikh Yusuf Estes. We've been talking about the misconceptions of scholars. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. If you ask me who my prophet is, I will say, haven't you heard? His name is Muhammad. A mercy to the world. A mercy to the world. If you ask me who my enemy is, I will say, don't you know? If you ask me who my enemy is, he's that same old devil, that same old devil.